Good evening, everybody. I can see participants entering. I'm going to wait just a, a minute or so for some more audience to arrive and start again and then start. Okay, good evening. I think we should start. I can't wait. I'm so excited about this session. Uh, this evening we're talking about poverty, insecurity and migration. And in the context of the COVID-19 problems. So we'll be addressing issues which we might call a syndemic. What happens when various difficulties come together, coalesce and combine to cause problems. There may be some debate among the, my panel members, I don't know about the, my use of the word syndemic. So I'm going to introduce all four speakers now, and then they will speak in turn for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have about an hour for questions. I would ask you please to use the question and answer function we won't be responding to um, material that you put onto the chat. We would prefer you to put, place your questions in the question and answer and we'll deal with those when all four speakers have spoken. So I'm going to introduce the speakers to you now. We have two world leaders and two junior academics, if I may put it that way. So it's a brilliant balance. Dr. Laura Hammond will lead. She is professor at SOAS in anthropology. Her research interests are food security, conflict, forced migration and diasporas. She is the challenge leader for security, protracted conflict, refugees and forced displacement for the Global Challenges Research Fund. She's head of the London International Development Centre's migration leadership team, and she's team leader for the research and evidence facility Horn of Africa window of the European Union Trust Fund for Africa. So you can see that she has she works throughout the world, particularly Africa, Europe, UK. She also is chair of the Independent Advisory Group for Country Information. She's worked in the Horn of Africa since 1993, with a particular emphasis on Ethiopia, Somalia, Somaliland, and she's undertaken consultancy for a wide range of development and humanitarian organizations, including UNDIP, USAID, Oxfam, Médecins Sans Frontières, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and the World Food Programme. She is the author of This Place Will Come Home, Refugee Repatriation to Ethiopia. And she co-edited with Johan Poitier and Christopher Kramer of Researching Violence in Africa, Ethical and Methodological Challenges. Dr. Shreya Banerjee is our second participant. She recently completed her PhD from the Center of Gender Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS. She completed her MA in Gender, Feminist and Women's Studies from York University, Toronto, Toronto and her thesis explored interstate and interregional marriage, migration and trafficking in India. Presently, she's looking at the impact of spatial regulation and gentrification on everyday lives of sex workers and their children in India and how it transforms the patterns and processes of social reproduction. 
Her research interests are in the areas of post-colonial theory, transnational feminist thought, social anthropology, critical legal theory, spatial and mobility politics, intersectionality, and gender and sexual politics in South Asia and the diasporas. Our third speaker is Dr. Aicha Balkadi. She's a senior teaching fellow and researcher in School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics at SOAS. Her research is characterized by two main strands, descriptive, theoretical and typological linguistics. Secondly, the languages and cultures of Algeria and North Africa. She's extensively focused on Berber, Amazigh, Afro-Asiatic, a collection of languages indigenous to the Maghreb and the Sahel regions. And she has strong expertise in Takbelit, Kabeli, excuse my pronunciation, a language spoken by approximately 6 million people in Algeria, France, and various global cities across the world, including London. Her research on Algerian languages is based on primary data collected from informants in Algeria and members of the Algerian diaspora in London. Aicha is a Berber language consultant for the Oxford English Dictionary and creator of the Homeschool Grammar website, providing linguistic grammar activities for children based on languages from the wider world. Professor Jonathan Goodhand is our final speaker. He is a professor in conflict and development studies in the Department of Development Studies at SOAS. He worked for some years managing humanitarian and development programs in conflict situations in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Sri Lanka, and has extensive experience as a researcher and advisor in South and Central Asia for a range of NGOs and aid agencies, including DFID, SDC, ILO, and UNDP. His research interests include the political economy of aid and conflict, borderlands, war economies, and illicit drugs and war to peace transitions. He is the principal investigator of a GCRF funded project, Drugs and Disorder, Building a Sustainable Peacetime Economy in the Aftermath of War. These are four amazing speakers, and I would like to give the floor now, if I may, to Laura Hammond. Laura, are you there? Hi, I am. Thank you very much, Alison. Um, yeah, I um, thanks for the, the nice introduction. I um, wanted to speak tonight about um, some work that I've been doing uh, in the Horn of Africa with my colleagues, um, particularly with the Research and Evidence Facility for the Horn of Africa, which is a team that I lead. Uh, we have about six people, core staff, and then we work with researchers all over the region. Um, and in particular, some of my remarks come from a paper that uh, my colleague Louisa Brain has been working on. So I want to really give her um, full credit for some of the thoughts that are coming out of this. Um, what I thought I would do is just um, speak about the impact of COVID-19. I know it, it's certainly impacting our research in the way that we have an ongoing research project and it's, it's had some concrete sort of logistical challenges, but I wanted to think about the ways in which the pandemic is affecting the lives of those who we work with as researchers, um, uh, who are research subjects, research collaborators um, as well. And um, to suggest that we really need to take um, uh, both a, to really be very um, upfront about using social science methods and thinking about social science or sort of social and economic aspects of people's lives when we look at the effects of the pandemic, but also then to suggest that we need to take a kind of nested look. So looking not only at what happens in the immediate sense of uh, kind of pu people's public health behavior, et cetera, but also more broadly at their changes in livelihood practices or changes in mobility and, and other kinds of things. So you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here to try to find the slide that I had, which now seems to be missing. Hang on a second. Um, that's quite odd. Seems to not be there anymore. Maybe I've got so many different things open, I can't see it anymore. There it is. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we, I work um, in the Horn of Africa. There are obviously um, quite a lot of people who are, who are on the move for various reasons. There are about 14 million displaced people within um, the Horn itself, mostly displaced as a result of the conflict in, in the ongoing conflict in Somalia, as well as South Sudan. And then there's a kind of 
uh, movement of people around the kind of Ethiopia Eritrea um, kind of neighborhood, if you like, that uh, is another fixture. So there's sort of three kind of displacement complexes, if you like. And I don't want to, I'm not going to go into m massive depth with regard to any of those particular um, populations, but I just wanted to start to um, look at this region as a whole and sort of think about the ways in which the pandemic has affected people. So the first kinds of um, reports of, of, the, of COVID in the region, really we started to be reported around mid-March, mid sorry, uh, 2020. And it quite quickly, uh, all countries in the region put some kind of border closure on. There was a real concern immediately, as, as in other parts of the world, with restricting people's mobility, making sure that people couldn't move between freely between uh, from one country to another. And that's really, really important. Borders in this part of the world are both uh, very porous, but they're also crucially important at keeping people's livelihoods going uh, for in a number of ways, whether it's pastoralists needing to get access grazing area, whether it's um, small, medium or large traders needing to get, a, get their goods from one side to another, people needing to get to labor markets, people needing to get to and from refugee camps, et cetera. So mobility is a really centrally important feature of this region. Um, the, um, I should probably just put this on a, on a presentation so you don't have to see all of my slides going forward. Um, so there are immediately these, uh, these border closures. There are also varying levels of lockdown, probably most um, tightly in Kenya and in Ethiopia, which also had the highest uh, rates of transmission with school closures, evening curfews, um, suspension of international and domestic flights, et cetera, and really kind of trying to move, protect, you know, keep people from moving. Um, that's had an impact, of course, across the whole population, but for people, who, again, who rely on mobility, who are migrants or displaced people, or who just rely on regular forms of mobility, these restrictions were, had, a, had a quite a significant uh, social and economic impact um, across the board. So if we just look at some of displaced communities and you think about what does it mean, what did it mean in the lives of people who are living in these places? In some cases, in, in most cases, they are confined to camps or settlements. Most countries um, have uh, kind of closed camp policies, particularly Kenya is probably the tightest. Uh, where people are not allowed, refugees who are registered in camp are not allowed to move in and out um, or to go to the nearest city, for instance, or to travel to Nairobi, the capital. Unlike Uganda, actually, where refugees are able to move more freely. So they're confined to camps and living in quite um, tightly, uh, tightly packed, uh, kind of highly dense populations. The photo kind of shows how uh, houses are quite right next to each other. Many people living in the same house. It's very difficult, of course, to maintain social distancing in an environment like that. Um, of course, then people also have difficulty accessing things like adequate water and soap. So the kinds of public health messages that we have all been used to um, are are outside the reach of many people who are who are living in displaced conditions within the region. They're not able to access enough water to, to keep clean all the time. Um, soap is something that is not available in all in all houses or in all households, particularly when people are on the move from one area to another. Um, face masks, etc. Very difficult to to have access to. Um, healthcare we know is already of a very kind of sporadic and usually uh, low quality in many of these communities and uh, have in, in a pandemic or in any kind of a, of a health public health emergency, the act, in, inability to access quality health care becomes even more important. We also can see that because partly because people are blocked from finding ways of supporting themselves through accessing labor markets or other or markets to sell their goods or um, to move back and forth across borders, they become more and more dependent upon aid resources. And those aid resources may be increasingly inadequate. Uh, we can see across the board in uh, globally that there is a, um, a re restriction, a constraint, constraining of the availability of international aid for emergencies, partly because donor countries are focused on their own health emergency, 
and are not making these, these resources as accessible. And then finally, many people who are displaced are relying on remittances as a lifeline, and I'll come back to that in a second. So on the, so my point about the kind of nested, um, the ways in which we kind of unpack these impacts to focus on you know, the, the, li the lives or the, um, the experiences of people like those in this photograph are to think about what are the immediate impacts? How, how are people, um, impacted by the kind of restraints on movement, the, the ability or inability to practice protective measures to protect themselves, uh, et cetera. And those are kind of you know, quite, quite localized, quite immediate. But I wanted to also suggest that there are, in order to, when we trace this out, we need to think about the other kinds of kind of um, sometimes more nested or more um, internationally connected factors that also play a really important role and which mean that this pandemic is not doesn't have just short term um, kinds of impacts, but also has longer term impacts. So by that I mean that we need to look at what kinds of what's happening in the wider kind of regional national global economies and the ways how is that impacting on um, the conditions of mobile populations. You can think, for instance, as an example, this photograph is not very good quality, but it is a picture of a Kenyan farm worker who is a labor migrant who is disposing of roses um, from the flower plantations in Kenya because of the collapse in the European demand for flowers um, in Kenya, and this was also the case in Ethiopia, huge enough stocks had to be destroyed and many people who depended on employment in the flower industry lost their jobs and had to travel back to their um, communities. So you can see that that's something that has not to do with how many people are getting COVID in Kenya or how, a bit, how able that worker is to protect themselves, but what's happening here in Europe in terms of um, demand overall. And that's been true with, with food crops um, as well um, and with other kinds of international value chains. As well, I mentioned remittances briefly a minute ago, really important to think about the ways in which remittance chains have been affected. So we see that many people have lost their jobs or have had to go on furlough or have had um, um, kind of healthcare crises in their own immediate nuclear families in diaspora communities. So for instance, I work a lot with the Somali community. The Somali community was extremely heavily hit by um, COVID in the first wave uh, this spring here in, in Europe. And uh, their ability to send remittance money back to their relatives living in the Horn of Africa was severely constrained. So again, you see that people have a, a lack of access to um, the income that they once relied on because of, not because of anything that's happening necessarily to them immediately in their communities, but because of um, the, the changes that are felt in the diaspora. And then finally, just wanted to mention this, this bit about um, the environmental impacts of restricting mobility. I think that one of the things that the work that I'm involved in is to try to think about how to come up with kind of appropriate recommendations for how to better to respond to um, COVID or other kinds of public health crises in displaced communities. And that's to say, that we shouldn't just lock everybody down and try to keep them from moving because that can have really severe negative impacts, um, economic impacts overall, but to think about other kinds of ways of helping people to move more safely, helping to mit mitigate the impacts of their immobility, if there is such a thing. So environmental impacts of restricting mobility um, really start to play out here where people are not able to move as much for grazing, for um, for um, selling off their livestock, et cetera. And so there can be increased um, use of the natural resource base, which can have a really significant impact on local economies. Um, that's all I wanted to, to say, but just to, to kind of, again, to reiterate um, the, uh, the really important um, aspects of using the social sciences, social sciences to unpack these impacts on uh, mobile populations, and as well to think about those kind of nested layers between this kind of local, national, regional, and global um, sort of dynamics to really understand what the full impact of something like the COVID-19 pandemic can have on mobile populations. I'll end there. I don't know, Alison, whether yeah, you- Yeah, excellent so much. Yes, I thank you so much. I was muted. <laughs>
<laughs> Sorry, do you know whether to come in or do you want me to pass on to the next speaker? I think if you could pass on now, please, to um, Sreya. And then at the end, we'll bring you all back on screen. Thank you so much. Sreya, welcome. Thank you, Alison. Um, thank you, Laura, for that insightful talk. Um, I also want to just begin uh, by thanking the organizers of this event uh, for inviting me as a panelist um, and to just say that I'm very excited to be here. Um, okay, so the topic that I'm going to um, present today uh, for this talk um, is certainly a work in progress. And uh, so I'm looking forward to any feedback, comments and questions that we may have in the Q&A session. Um, and I have um, just recently started to explore um, this topic, uh, mainly for uh, postdoctoral uh, fellowship types of um, opportunities, but I'm also working on uh, publishing uh, some online blog posts and journal articles on the different uh, sort of dimensions of the larger uh, research topic. Um, so the presentation I have here today focuses a lot more on um, COVID, um, the aspect of COVID than what I have proposed uh, for my fellowship, for instance. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, begin. On October 7, 2020, the National Human Rights Commission advisory in India officially recognized sex workers as informal workers under the Women at Work section, enabling them to access necessary beneficiary schemes and aids to tackle the daily impact of COVID-19. The recommendations for sex workers were advocated and submitted by the National Network of Sex Workers, an umbrella organization in India. They were based on the assessment of the various consequences of the pandemic and their impact on the rights and welfare of sex workers being a marginalized community. While this is a significant milestone for sex workers coalitions and their decade long advocacy in India, it is important to ask why did it take several months for the government to address the vulnerable conditions of sex workers who have been struggling to survive without adequate food, financial support, medical attention and shelter in this pandemic? To what extent has the pandemic shifted the facilitation, arrangement and execution of sex work and at the same time made work even more precarious? How do we rethink the law's key role in shaping the meaning and perceptions of women's reproductive labor in informal and intimate sectors such as sex work? To think about these questions, I will briefly draw on post-colonial debates and socio-legal approaches to sex work to understand how they have informed existing structural, social, economic, and political inequalities, and also epistemic violence of sex workers, and to what extent they have been exacerbated in the COVID-19 crisis. Sex work is one of the oldest professions in India that has been historically pursued and operated by women and transgender groups. However, social perceptions and laws mobilized by the colonial state to regulate prostitution and then criminalize prostitute women contributed to a global panic and moral panic. Under colonial rule, the British relied on Indian prostitutes to fulfill the desire, sexual desires of their troops. Hence, they established special conditions to manage the practice of prostitution, but also ensured that a clear boundary is maintained between Indian mistresses and British wives to uphold their prestige as rulers of the nation. The tolerance and to some extent acceptance of prostitutes by Indian communities left the British baffled. It motivated them to impose certain perspectives and conceptions of morality and sexuality to justify their control over Indian bodies and sexualities. Therefore, the eventual legalization of prostitution was an institutional strategy that permitted the regulation and management of Indian women's sexual and affective labor. In the contemporary and post-colonial context, the legacies of colonialism, capitalism, and patriarchy have fostered various forms and layers of violence, which contributes to the vulnerabilities and subjugation of sex workers. As Western and international conceptualization of trafficking infiltrated Indian laws, the conflation of sex work and prostitution, migration and mobility became a common dilemma and the starting point of polarized disputes. 
At present, prostitution is considered legal in the Indian legal system and tolerated under the informal sector according to the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1986 or the ITPA, which is the primary legal legislative framework used to address prostitution. The ITPA prohibits the preservation of brothels, prostitution as a primary source of income, provoking or restraining someone for the purpose of sex work, and prostitution and solicitation in social and public areas. Even now, sex work is not an illegal act, yet all the other activities that are necessary to sustain the business of sex work and perform sexual servitude as a form of reproductive labor are considered unlawful according to the ITPA. Nonetheless, these activities cannot be isolated and their persistence has developed wide ranging positions, particularly amongst uh, contemporary feminists on the question of prostitution in the Indian context. Sex work is highly stigmatized and made invisible because it is often linked to sexual and physical exploitation uh, that are evident in human trafficking and situations of modern slavery. For over two decades, individuals, critical legal theorists, and transnational feminist perspectives have argued against this perception and interpret sex work as a work that sex workers as agentive subjects choose to engage in as a form of livelihood and exercise their ability to navigate and negotiate institutional constraints, the law, and the sex and uh, sex work governance. They have worked within and beyond human rights law to examine the repercussions of inadequate anti-trafficking measures and understand multiple layers of migration and sex work through a political economy framework. And some of the work um, that I uh, look into and become inspired by are of Janet Halley, Prabha Kotiswaran, and Ratna Kapoor. This is precisely where I locate myself uh, as my work seeks to theorize sex work as a form of reproductive labor that should be defined and understood by critically analyzing the axis of consent, choice, and the market economy, while exploring questions of power, agency, and mobility. I'm interested in examining the law's approach to regulate and potentially eradicate sex, sex work that often begins with processes of gentrification and mobility management to understand how it contributes to the restructuring of sex work and shifts in social reproduction, particularly in the context of the present crisis. Through a critical legal perspective and an intersectional feminist lens, I think about how the right to work, right to mobility, and the right to space are intertwined for sex workers and influence their lived experiences of insecurity, spatial conflict, and exclusion. Although spatial practices of sex, sex workers have been studied in existing research, very little has been explored in the Indian context about the connection between embodied spaces, shifts in family structures, and the sexual politics of domesticity, and how this shapes their social, political, and intimate relations. Most importantly, there is limited empirical evidence demonstrating how children of sex workers experience and understand um, experiences of displacement, isolation, and socio-spatial politics. When movements of deterritorialization de take place or their embodied spaces are under threat, it is important to understand its impact on the capabilities of sex worker mothers to protect and care in such precarious circumstances. Hence, the ways in which space is used and appropriated by sex workers and their children are to a great extent entangled. The dimension of children of sex workers in my study it demands a closer look at how shifts in mobility, spatiality, family structure, and domesticity inform new struggles and transformations in social reproduction, care, and politics of intimate labors. The alternative positions of anti-trafficking and abolitionist groups support the criminalization of sex work, arguing that it is an extraction of labor through coercive, violent, and exploitative methods, which renders sex workers as victims and modern slaves without choice or agency. These perspectives are being stimulated to intensify control measures and spatial regulation during the pandemic, implying that the eradication of sex work is one of the effective approaches to tackle the condition in India. For instance, a recently released study produced by researchers and scientists from Harvard Medical School, Yale P School of Public Health, and the Massachusetts General Hospital 
suggested that red light district areas in five major cities of the country should be shut down to flatten the curve and reduce emerging COVID-19 cases by 72% and deaths by 63%. The public circulation of the study via popular media outlets offered scope for the police to threaten sex workers to permanently close brothels and restrict their means of income. This study is particularly controversial and misleading because it assumes that sex workers are primarily brothel based when in fact, most are home-based and street-based sex workers operating from different places and engaged in other forms of labor outside of sex work. And a lot about this can be found in the book Street Corner Secrets by Shvati Shah that was uh, published in 2014. Moreover, pub prohibiting physical contact as a method of protection and prevention may be exclusive to the context of the coronavirus. However, the conceptual and practical existence of social distancing is not new in a place like India, where people are stigmatized and segregated because of disparities in gender, class, caste, sexuality, religion, and ethnicity. For instance, for a large number of caste-based and tribe-based sex workers from the Bidia, Bachata, and Birna communities, sex work is their only source of income. They are segregated and considered criminals under the Criminal Tribes Act in India. The authors of the study do not take into account how existing stigma and discrimination prevent sex workers to get a hospital bed or to have, or to what extent is it realistic to believe that they will be a community prioritized when an effective vaccine becomes available given the nature of their profession. I attended a webinar back in July led by human rights activists, sex workers, scholars, and researchers in India that discuss the Im impact of the pandemic on the livelihood of bar dancers and sex workers. Dr. Sudhakar Nuthi, who is one of the contributors of the Yale Harvard study, was also invited as a panelist to expand his views and key arguments from the study. He argued, and I quote, Medical institutions have put sex work in the highest risk category of professions for getting COVID-19. The only other occupations in, in that highest risk category are medical workers. Sex work will be highly risky for sex workers and cities until a vaccine is developed and widely distributed. Sex workers should be considered heroes by cities for stopping their work during the pandemic and should be given financial support and reemployment programs during this period, given the impact of their business. We must find ways to create income without sex workers dying. This is the only solution to the crisis. To this, the other panelists, including sex workers, responded by pointing out that shutting down red light districts implies that sex workers are considered a global health burden, which echoes the structural inequalities, discrimination and exclusion they faced in the colonial period and during the HIV AIDS pandemic uh, epidemic. They questioned Dr. Nuthi's point about pursuing alternative livelihoods and argued that most sex workers already have additional ways of earning an income and that the assumption that this is something that they should be strictly impl implemented overlooks their agentive cap capabilities. While the All India Network of Sex Workers specified that 60% or, or 3,000 sex workers in Delhi were for forced to leave the city for their home states after suffering from a lack of food, medicine, and financial support, Sex workers in the webinar expressed that many of them could not, many of them cannot return home because they are unaware, because they are unwanted there. Several had been abandoned, trafficked, or entered sex work after growing up as an orphan. While national human rights NGOs and sex worker-led organizations have been working tirelessly to provide dry ration, medicines, masks, and sanitizers. However, it is difficult for many of them to claim these essentials from the government because they do not have adequate proof of identification, such as the Aadhaar card or a residence certificate. This is particularly concerning for both internal and cross-border migrant workers. Such everyday impacts of the pandemic have motivated many sex workers to transform the facilitation and practice of sex work, including shifting towards digital platforms.
However, as pointed out by Mina Seishu, the founder of VAMP and Sangram, using online methods have proved to be risky because clients have used videos of the woman to blackmail them, especially housewives or home-based sex workers who are invisible and wish to con and wish not to um, and wish to conceal their identity as a sex worker. Virtual sex workers have also struggled with obtaining payment and navigating the new territory of the online space, which is always uncertain. Obtaining access to these spaces and technological devices are also challenging, especially for elderly sex workers. These perspectives and debates around the right to work, right to mobility, and the right to space are intergenerational and have been expanding or evolving across spatial and temporal domains. While it is important to critically think about the, the pragmatic impact of these discourses and measures, it is also important to think about their role in promoting epistemic violence. Meaning, merely understanding sex workers as the other or gender and sexual minorities that are vulnerable to violence and exploitation and therefore require those that are more educated, elite or located in the West to rescue and rehabilitate because they cannot understand, protect or survive on their own. A rights-based approach that considers sex workers as key stakeholders are necessary in any form of knowledge production that is concerned about the welfare, about their welfare and not about the physical existence of brothels. A way to prevent epistemic violence in pedagogical contributions would be to critically engage with the decolonization of knowledge. This is relevant to understanding how reductionist and mono monolithic representations of marginalized groups, particularly women of color, are challenged and interrupted through kaleidoscopic consciousness, which is a term and a concept used by Jose Medina to recognize that knowledge is always in conflict and resistant to different perspectives of individuals and communities, but this is necessary for praxis to encourage constructive epistemic resistance and ensure accountability for epistemic flaws. Here, hence to imagine a post-pandemic future for sex workers requires taking into account their knowledge or different ways of knowing um, which is uh, which has been uh, explored in the book Epistemologies of the South by De Souza Santos as a valid piece of evidence that is shaped by their struggles, resistance, and lived experiences. Lastly, for research like this, I think SOAS is a perfect institution because it encourages multidisciplinary research rooted in critical thinking, collaborative approaches, and global perspectives. Um, I, it has equipped me as an early research, career researcher to transcend barriers and foster transnational connections through my research. Since I locate my work at the intersection of gender, law, and anthropology, the interdisciplinary backgrounds and expertise of faculty members across the gender studies, anthropology, and politics departments are particularly beneficial. What is even more exciting and fascinating is the new research that is being produced on sex workers in India and their experiences of gentrification called The Social Life of Sex Workers in a Gentrifying Neighborhood of Kamathipura uh, by Pooja Krishnakumar from the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. Um, I'm not sure if she's watching this, but I hope uh, it's not upsetting that I have mentioned her work here. Um, but yes, uh, that's it for me. Um, and I'd just like to pass it on to the next presenter. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Shreya. Fascinating work. I hope we can come back to that in the questions. Uh, Aisha, Aisha, welcome. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm going to share my screen now. Put the all right okay can you uh can you all see uh can you all see my my powerpoint yep yes okay um thank you um alison for inviting me to uh to talk to um in the, in this panel and thank you for um uh, the people who have uh, spoken before me they were very interesting talks and uh I hope I haven't forgotten everything that I want to say because I was so <laughs> fascinated by the previous talks. I, I, I think I, I hope I haven't forgotten everything that I want to say in my own talk. So um, I want to talk uh, 
today about the uh, effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on um, uh, marginalized or minoritized linguistic communities or people who across the, the world who speak uh, minoritized languages. And there are a, a number of ways in which uh, these communities have been um, impacted uh, by the pandemic because of uh, the languages that they speak. Uh, but I, um, I will focus on, on issues that relate to the kind of research uh, that we do here at SOAS in the Department of uh, Linguistics at SOAS. So um, one of the ways in which uh, um, uh, minoritized linguistic communities have been uh, particularly affected by the pandemic is um, you know, in relation to the issue of language endangerment. Um, we estimate that there are about 7,000 languages spoken across the world, and 43% uh, of these uh, languages are uh, endangered. Uh, it means that they are spoken between, um, by less than 1,000 people, some by less than 100 people. Uh, these speakers who speak these languages, uh, speakers who speak these languages are uh, for the most part elderly, um, children do not acquire uh, endangered languages, these languages as their first language. Uh, so the uh, COVID-19 and particularly the, the, the high death toll uh, or from uh, COVID-19, especially amongst older members of communities, especially in communities that uh, live in remote areas across the world, uh, in communities that have have um, less access to health services, uh, the, the, this death toll in these communities uh, from COVID-19 has accentuated, accelerated the issue of language endangerment. Uh, there are languages that are at an increased, uh, increased risk of disappearing very soon um, because of uh, the pandemic. Now, uh, since the, the beginning, since the, the beginning of um, of the uh, of, of COVID-19 in, in March 2020, uh, we've had reports uh, that, uh, you know, elderly members of communities speaking uh, endangered Amazonian languages in uh, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador um, have died from COVID-19. And with their death, of course, uh, comes the disappearance um, of uh, the languages, the, uh, the indigenous languages that they speak. We've had similar reports um, in the south and the southeast of Asia, in particular, uh, you know, uh, about indigenous, the indigenous languages spoken by the great Andanamese people. Uh, we've had similar reports uh, about Aboriginal languages spoken in Australia and closer to, uh, to home here in Europe. Uh, we've had similar reports about a dialect spoken in, uh, in Italy, the Lombard dialect. Um, the other ways in which uh, minoritized linguistic communities are um, uh, negatively impacted or affected by the COVID-19 pandemic because, again, because of the language uh, that they speak is with respect to um, health information. Uh, we know that many um, uh, marginalized or uh, minoritized linguistic communities um, have almost no access to COVID-19 information to um, health uh, guidance or advice uh, in their language, in the language that they speak. Uh, we don't have uh, official numbers, uh, but uh, um, Mandana Saifedinipur from, um, you know, from SOAS, from the, um, the uh, ILAR archive at SOAS, and her colleague uh, Di Carlo uh, in uh, March or April, April 2020 estimated that about half of the world, half of the people uh, in the world do not have access to uh, um, to COVID-19 information in their own uh, 
language. Uh, now, this is a, a, a serious issue for these individuals, but also for uh, larger communities, because we know that um, with a disease like COVID-19, for which we don't have any cure or any vaccine, prevention is uh, very important. And, um, you know, for prevention to be efficient, uh, information has dissemination of information plays uh, a crucial role. So if the information cannot be disseminated, is not disseminated in uh, a language that is spoken and understood by half, uh, uh, but in lang I mean, it is not disseminated to uh, half of the population of the world, uh, this is uh, quite problematic. Um, now, in this respect, there are um, actually some uh, good news. Uh, there are many linguists and many organizations across the world that are uh, that have been working since the beginning of the pandemic that have been working uh, on the translation of uh, vital important uh, COVID-19 information in minoritized languages in endangered languages, particularly the languages of um, Africa and Asia. And um, also uh, there's uh, an organization from SOAS called uh, Viral Language, uh, Viral Languages, which is, um, you know, um, um, a website created, a, um, you know, um, in, in collaboration between the SOAS World um, Language Institute and the University of Buffalo in the United States. Um, and um, another good news uh, comes from Algeria, which is a, a country that I know very well because I, I, I work on this country and I work on the languages that are spoken there. And I know a little bit about the, the linguistic policies um, in Algeria and uh, Algeria the government of Algeria is generally uh, not, um, you know, very uh, uh, good, uh, very interested in uh, minority languages uh, spoken in Algeria, particularly the, the Berber languages. Um, and since the beginning of the pandemic, in fact, the government uh, in Algeria is uh, sort of making a lot of efforts in, um, you know, disseminating COVID-19 information in these minoritized languages, in the Berber languages. Uh, the government has, for instance, instructed local radios um, in uh, re local radios of different regions to uh, disseminate COVID-19 information uh, in the local Berber variety spoken by um, the speakers. There's also a lot of young uh, Berber uh, speakers who um, share short videos you know, giving COVID-19 information, uh, COVID-19 advice in, uh, in the different uh, Berber languages that are um, spoken in Algeria. Another, um, you know, um, effect that um, or impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on linguistic minorities, um, you know, concern children and, and particularly uh, children. I mean, I want to focus, you know, on children in the UK, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has affected um, children from linguistic, um, from minoritized linguistic communities in, in other uh, languages, uh, in other countries, um, sorry. Um, in, the, in the UK, the, the lockdown, the COVID-19 lockdown that occurred, uh, you know, uh, between uh, March and uh, March 2020 and July 2020 has led to the closure of uh, schools. And uh, these school closures have uh, a number of studies um, and recent research have uh, found that uh, the school closures has accentuated uh, educational inequalities, existing educational inequalities. And uh, in a lot of cases, uh, these educational inequalities, um, you know, affect or have affected uh, children from uh, families where English is not the main language. So has affected children um, from, you know, who speak um, 
uh, and a language in addition to English uh, and also has affected children who um, speak uh, varieties of English that are minoritized. So varieties of English that are not um, uh, British standard English. And uh, of course the inequalities or, you know, the, um, the, the, the gap that exists uh, between uh, the gap, sorry, in learning that has been created by lockdown between uh, these children who do not, whose family do not speak English or who do not speak, um, you know, British standard English and the other uh, families uh, where British standard English is spoken at home. Uh, these uh, inequalities, this, um, you know, this, this widening of the learning gap um, is caused because uh, in schools, the language that is used in the UK in schools is uh, British standard English. Everything is done in British standard English. Um, and uh, literacy, uh, grammar learning is uh, in British Standard English. And so um, I, during the, uh, before the pandemic, I was already, uh, you know, trying to think about how my own research on um, a, a diversity of languages from across the world on the grammar, uh, the syntax, the, the semantic, the morphology um, of a diversity of languages, how my research uh, could, uh, you know, contribute to um, um, to sort of like diminishing uh, these educational inequalities, but also uh, to uh, give uh, children who do not speak uh, standard varieties of English or who speak um, um, heritage languages here in the UK, how they could, uh, you know, learn uh, grammar, uh, use their uh, own language, their own varieties in, uh, in their education. Uh, and so I uh, created um, a website called, uh, called uh, Homeschool Grammar, and uh, I created it with the support of the SOAS World Language Institute and the linguistic department here at SOAS. And uh, during lockdown, this website was created mainly to support parents and carers who were homeschooling, um, you know, their children. And uh, one of its aims was to foster um, in children an interest in studying language and languages, but also to develop in them an understanding um, and respect of the world's diversity of languages, cultures, and knowledge. And so the website contains a, a range of activities that follow the UK Key Stage 2 grammar curriculum. Um, and uh, the activities introduce a, a range of grammar concepts from the, the grammar uh, curriculum in the UK Key Stage 2 through a variety of the world's languages, including uh, different varieties of English, um, endangered languages, famous ancient ling languages, but also uh, UK heritage uh, languages. Um, and that, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you and Tan uh, Mirta, as we say uh, in, in Berber. So I think I um, can uh, now uh, let the, the next speaker um, speak. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aicha. That's fascinating material. Jonathan, just before you begin, could I, could I ask people, please, I would encourage you, if I may, to, um, to use the question and answer because you may have questions which spontaneously come to you while a speaker is talking. And it would be lovely if we could have them on the question and answer session, and then we'll come back to them at the end. So welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was going to share the screen, but I don't see what to do. Then. Anyway, it's OK. Um, so I'm going to talk um, a little bit about my the experience um, we have in the Drugs and Disorder Project. Um, and just to give you a very short background, it's a four-year Global Challenges Research Fund project. 
Um, it's called Drugs and Disorder, Building Sustainable Peacetime Economies in the Aftermath of War. And it's asking a base, a very big question. It's asking how can war economies tr be transformed into peace economies with a focus on one of the key commodities driving war economies and that's illicit drugs. Um, and we're involved in uh, research in three of the biggest producers of illicit drugs in the world, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Colombia. And we're doing research in nine drug affected borderland regions, um, which have become key hubs in the trafficking, the production and consumption of drugs. And we're doing this partly because these borderlands are hubs, but also we think these borderlands um, are central to the question about how war economies become peace economies. And we also feel that borderland communities perspectives, the people who are involved in illicit economies are basically missing from the debates around drugs development and peace building. Um, we've got, there are 12 different partners involved in this project, so it's a very big project. And since um, March, we've more or less had to suspend all field work in the borderland sites. And so COVID itself presents a major challenge to, to research projects of this nature, as well as being a huge moment of rupture for the borderland communities that we're doing research with and working with. Um, in response to this, we've, we've formed a COVID research group within our project to better understand how to work in COVID and also how to work on COVID as a, as a research issue. And I'm happy to, to talk about this more in the questions, um, but I do think it's important to note that for researchers, COVID does present a set of really quite profound challenges, I mean, organizationally and logistically, but also methodologically and ethically about how one does research in this environment. And it's a very important stress test for our project um, in terms of how robust our partnerships are and, and, and also how we can continue doing research in this environment. Um, so that's about working in COVID, working on COVID. It means kind of really how are we reorienting our, prod, uh, our program to better understand what's happening in the sites that we're, we're working in. And uh, we have an, a number of emerging issues and hunches, um, which we will explore hopefully when we can get back into the field, which um, we're hoping will be, who knows, but we're hoping um, towards um, sometime next year. So, that's the rest of my talk is really going to be about some of these kinds of ideas that, um, and, and some of the feedbacks coming from our partners about how COVID is affecting borderland lives and livelihoods um, over the last few months. And it's important to just kind of uh, uh, just foreground a few key, uh, a few kind of quick comments about the nature of these borderland spaces where we're doing research. First of all, linking to what Laura was saying earlier, these are highly extroverted spaces, they're transnational spaces. They're, places of hypermobility, people's livelihoods depend on movement, they're connected into regional and global circuits of trade, of finance, of commodities, of ideas. Um, so people's livelihoods are deeply embedded and connected to movements. And uh, whether it's labor migration and remittances or whether it's the control of movements of coca, opium, methamphetamines, jade, pharmaceuticals, fuel, and so on. There are also places of violence, uh, a lot of different forms of violence. There have been repeated cycles of armed conflict in these, these spaces in wartime and in notional post-war transitions. But also we've seen the mutation of different forms of violence, structural violence, um, uh, paramilitary-based violence, the slow violence of drug use, um, and a, a fragmentation of the means of violence. They're places where the government footprint is, is limited or fitful and always contested and government services are often limited, particularly as we'll see in a minute, healthcare. Um, the areas where the development indicators are, are much lower than many other parts of the country, high levels of spatial inequality. At the same time, process of accumulation in these borderland regions are linked to process of investment and development in, in national and regional centers. Property markets depend upon illicit trade going on in these borderland spaces. So to finish off, they're very high risk environments and people are learning to deal with, have, have learned over generations to deal with radical uncertainty. Um, and illicit economies are, are central to that story about navigating uncertainty and risk. Illicit economies enable people to navigate risk 
to escape reproduction squeezes, to provide a safety net, to access land and credit and so on. So I think as all four of, the, all four of these talks have shown that um, yeah, it, the, the COVID-19 really has accentuated marginality. And marginality is something that's actively created. And what COVID does is intensify, the, intensify these processes of marginalization. And I'm going to give a few examples of that now. Um, the, the final thing to say in a background about these border regions is they, in the, the three countries, have all become vectors or transmission zones for the spread of the pandemic. Um, each country's on, um, next to or approximate to major hubs of, of, of COVID. So Iran, China, and Brazil have been you know, through the borderlands of, uh, of Afghanistan, Colombia, and Myanmar, there's been a spread um, following the pathways and routes that connect these borderlands to metropolitan hubs. And there's a kind of a paradox in governmental responses to this, this pandemic in that what, you know, it's something that's you know, you know, it's a transnational global phenomenon, but very nationalist and state-centered responses emerge. And as Laura's mentioned about the hardening of borders, the attempt to manage and stem these unwanted flows. Um, we've seen the closure of the China-Myanmar Myanmar border, for example, the closure of the Afghan-Iranian border, which affects formal trade, it affects informal trade, it affects remittances. Um, and perversely, these kinds of mechanisms actually push borderland communities into a closer relationship with illicit economies. And I think moving ahead, what we're going to see is illegal economies actually central to how people cope with and emerge from this pandemic. Um, the other thing to say here is that the, the health economy trade-off that we're, we're, we're talking about constantly in, in, in you know, the industrialized West, about the template of lockdowns, of social distancing, um, in order to, um, to protect the, the healthcare system, is much less relevant and perhaps even impossible in the broadland sites that we're looking at. In most cases, there's a limited healthcare system to even protect. And the most urgent and life and death matters are usually around destitution and economic livelihoods. So this health, health economy trade-off looks quite different from the perspective of the border regions that we're, we're studying. The other thing that um, uh, comes out, um, in, in, at least is in emerging from our field work, is about the link, the relationship between COVID and state fragility and violence. Now there was a kind of a, initially when COVID, the, the pandemic emerged, there was some kind of optimistic narratives about it would reset the conflict, that it would shift the balance of power and there would be kind of new open opportunities opening up for peace processes and, and, and more stability. We, we haven't seen that at all. Um, it's, there has not been a transformatory moment that shifted the dynamics of, of, of conflict. We've actually seen the opposite, that COVID seems to have created a more permissive environment for more militarized and more authoritarian measures. And in, in Colombia in particular, COVID is, has shifted the constellation of political and social forces and strengthened the position of the government in relation to drug eradication. Um, there's been, uh, it's, it, it's, it's closed down the spaces for social protests, the cocoleras, coca farmers protesting against forms of eradication. This ban on large meeting has crippled these forms of social protest. The lack of access of journalists to the borderlands and to international observers means there's less checks and balances on the government. And so it's created this permissive environment for the government to pursue a much more militarized, a much harsher form of and drug eradication, which is pushing um, uh, coca farmers who rely on, on, on illicit economies into integrated destitution. Um, I can talk more in the question and answer if people want to ask about specific dynamics, for example, around Afghanistan and Myanmar and the peace process and conflict, but it's a very similar story um, how COVID has intensified pre existing conflict dynamics. There's a, an interesting set of questions that we, we, we would like to, 
explore moving forward in, in terms of how COVID is, is changing um, state society relations. Um, certainly the feedback we're getting um, from our partners is that COVID has, has intensified and in playing into a very common narrative amongst borderline communities of state abandonment, a deep historical resentment um, which lives on in border, borderline memories about um, the lack of state services, the only face of the state being the violent, coercive face of the state. And the way that the COVID measures have essentially, the distribution effects have, have laid kind of, um, the costs of these effects have been much more um, borne by vulnerable communities in borderland areas. The lockdowns, the border hardening, these are things that are having very sharp shocks on people's livelihoods and, and ways of surviving. There's also an important thing to think about is the longer term developmental costs of COVID and the international response. And again, it's too early to, to predict this, but there is a, certainly a danger and it's, um, of how donors are now permit, um, pivoting towards kind of health and emergency responses with the consequent danger that that means the, the longer term development and peace building measures um, of investment in these countries, these borderland spaces, um, the, the, the funding will, um, will be, rather than adding new funding, will be redeployed and there'll be an opportunity cost um, in relation to transforming war economies into peace economies. Um, I think our, there are kind of other um, questions and issues, I and mean, if there are other questions and issues, there's quite a lot of interesting things about how um, transnational organized crime and drug economies themselves are shifting in this new environment. And um, if there are questions, answers and that, uh, we, we could talk about it more. But I guess one thing that comes out clearly is borderlands are areas of extreme innovation and experimentation. And one can see very quickly how um, illicit trade and illicit drug economies are adapting in, in very kind of uh, nimble ways to this, this new environment, perhaps more so than legal uh, and illicit economies. But I'll leave it at that. And uh, um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. This is an amazing panel. I'm really, really enjoying it. I would ask you if I may, please panelists, will you now um, show yourselves again <laughs> all at once? And I would like some more questions in the question and answer session. Um, let's have a look. We've got a question. Let's, let's sort these out to start with. Kevin is asking Laura, how was the curfew imposed? Was there resistance? What were the penalties of breaking the curfew? And did the aid workers from overseas return home when COVID appeared? Are you able to answer that for us? Laura, would you like yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the questions um, and thank you for staying with us. I don't know what time it is in Thailand, but it's very late. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the uh, curfews, there have been different approaches. Um, and, and I think when they were first imposed, they were more staunchly um, kind of policed. And the most extreme example probably was in Kenya, where um, uh, there were actually police were actually beating people up who were found on the street breaking curfew. So, um, which led to a kind of backlash of, you know, people being beaten up for not, um, uh, for not, you know, protecting, pro not in the, in the name of not protecting their health, that they're actually being um, subjected to physical abuse. Um, that has waned in time now, you know, the curfew has been lifted uh, for the most part in most places. Um, but it was, it, I mean, what happened was basically that it proved to be impossible to entirely police because people have the need to get out. You know, if you have a choice between the short term sort of survival needs of yourself and your family versus the, even the medium term potential, not certain risk of content, contracting a, an illness, which might or might not make you very ill might actually pass you by without making you very ill. The choices are pretty clear for most people who are um, you know, facing poverty and they would do what they need to do in order to protect their, you know, to ensure that they're able to, 
eat from one day to the next. So, so it just proved impossible to police really, um, which isn't to say that it won't come back, uh, that the curfews won't return. Um, certainly there, yeah, we, we have plenty of experience to show that curfews are a regular feature, not just in Kenya and Ethiopia as well and, and in other places. And so it's important to kind of look at uh, and for those of us who kind of follow them to, to critique their use as a, as a public health measure in this respect. Um, in terms of the uh, removal of humanitarian workers, from, not just from the Horn of Africa, but from refugee settings and, and other kinds of humanitarian emergencies, yes, it's happened everywhere. Um, it has impacted, I would say it's impacted organizations that um, don't have really good decentralized networks most severely. So for years we've been banging on about the need to localize humanitarian aid and that's not been done to any meaningful ex extent. I think only 4% of uh, international humanitarian funds are available, made available to local sources still. Um, but, but some organizations are better able to work through their local um, partners on the ground and to support them adequately to be able to do that kind of work. And those organizations were most able to continue functioning and had less disruption. Unfortunately, because as I've said, so localization has taken, has been so slow to take root. Um, it meant that many people, you know, left their countries and uh, programs were suspended, uh, closed down or, you know, just put on hold. And so it, there's been a really strong impact, not just on the ability to deal with COVID-19, but as well, the ability to deliver other forms of humanitarian support. Thank you very much. I think we also have a question. Um, Kevin's been very busy. A question for Aicha. Aicha Balkadi, two points. Uh, I mourn the loss of many regional accents within the UK. Being 69, as a child living in London, the yearly reunion in the 50s meant that many of my father's comrades stayed with us. One from Coventry, my father had to translate and we, others and I had to concentrate to understand. Even my mother's accent, being from Yorkshire, has softened in my lifetime. Please comment. You're muted, Aicha, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, I, 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 I will try to comment and I certainly can answer, but I would like to sort of like make it clear that Unfortunately, I'm not an expert on uh, the the varieties of English in uh, in the UK, the regional uh, varieties of English in the UK, uh, as I specialize more on sort of Africa and North Africa. But so what I think you are calling accents were actually probably in the 50s, uh, you know, what we would call now dialect. So, you know, even sort of like different uh, dialects of English with uh, their own phonological rules and their own uh, lexicon. And that would explain why your father had to translate uh, for you when people visited for, uh, you know, from Coventry and why you had to concentrate. Um, now, uh, of course, these dialects are uh, sort of uh, disappearing in the UK and the different accents as well are um, uh, fading. There's, a, there's a, some kind of standardization or what we call leveling that is occurring um, in the UK and, and in other countries, I guess, where um, regional accents, um, you know, are, are changing and are getting more similar to the standard accent. Um, in the UK, I think accents are becoming like more like the, the southern, uh, you know, London accents. And that's because, you know, um, the southern, the London accent or the British standard accent is more prestigious. Uh, and people, you know, have more access to that accent through, you know, TV, radio, social media, etc. So, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question also from Kevin again, um, about, for Jonathan, 
Uh, I live in Thailand. Illicit drugs are very easy to access. This recent article illustrates Thailand and Myanmar destroyed 25 tons of illicit drugs collectively worth more than 2 billion on Friday. It said the tide of drugs was growing as organized crime gangs boost supply and find new channels to do business. So Kevin's question, it's not really a question, it's a comment, but it would open up perhaps for you, Jonathan, as you suggested, you might talk a little bit more about how very adept organized crime groups are at adapting to these crisis times. Would you like to unmute and address that for us, please? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I suppose the, the first thing to say is um, we're interested in the, the way that drug economies are, are deeply embedded in the social life and the political life of these borderland regions. And, and so we're, we're looking at this historically and uh, rather than just one episode of a drug seizure, for example, or even just um, um, the, the adaptation now in relation to COVID. So I think there's a, we have to understand that, that deep history and uh, the, um, what we're finding in our research on the Myanmar, um, China and Thailand border is a deep challenge to the kind of the narrative, um, the kind of the mainstream policy narrative about if you bring peace, if you bring development, then you get rid of drugs. Because what Myanmar shows, actually, it's the opposite. Ceasefires in the early 1990s and the opening up of these regions to process of rapid development, including Chinese capital, um, mining, pipelines, commercial agriculture, has gone hand in hand with the big increase of, of drugs. And these are not only poppy and opium, but as you know, probably, Kevin, you know, methamphetamine is huge now in, in these regions. So there's something interesting going on here, which runs completely counter to the orthodoxy. Um, and, and yes, there, there are seizures going on. Um, but as we know, the, these seizures um, are only an absolutely minuscule amount of the drugs that, that are flowing. And the markets now are, um, well, the markets actually are in Myanmar itself. So there's a major problem of drug use within in Shan and Kachin states, for example, but also the markets go into China, to Thailand, to Singapore and to Australia. Um, and so unless we think of this kind of issue in a more kind of holistic way in which centers and peripheries, hubs and these marginal borderland regions are connected, um, then, you know, form, you know fit, hardening borders, seizure, counter-narcotics policies are, are, are actually not going to have their stated goals at all. Um, now, on the question about how um, organized crime is adapting uh, in this current environment, the honest answer is we don't have enough solid evidence about this at the moment. But what we do know is methamphetamine production is, is increasing, has not been affected by COVID. And so um, the precursor chemicals, the, the, the sites have not been affected. Um, the people involved have found ways of moving the commodity. What we interestingly have found is that drug users within Myanmar, within Myanmar are finding it more difficult to get access to drugs um, because the, the kind of the brokers, um, the people who are moving drugs to um, from the kind of the, the, the regional centers into the border regions. Um, they're finding it more difficult to move things because of lockdown. But for the bigger players, um, they can they can find ways of, of, of getting around this. And certainly the flows seem to be going and continuing. So, um, I mean, I, we're finding there's forms of adaptation going on in Colombia and also in Afghanistan. Um, but this is something we need to do more, more work on. And it's difficult to do research on this, of course, because it's very sensitive. So could I just follow up with a question, Jonathan, which is, you know, a million dollar question. This uh, against the orthodoxy trend, which as you say, is if you bring peace and prosperity to certain countries, then criminality of a very lethal kind actually may increase. 
do you have a sense of what's happening here and how it could be altered and improved? Um, we certainly don't pretend at this stage to have an answer to this question, but we've got a few hunches that we're, we're exploring. I mean, I think the the, the very obvious um, big question is about what kind of development is happening in, in these spaces, on whose terms, and what are the distributional effects of those forms of developments. So the kinds of developments that we, we have seen in the, in the frontiers of Colombia or in the, the borderlands of Myanmar are highly extractive and, and there's forms of accumulation by dispossession taking place. So land grabs, um, extractive mining, oil companies, cattle ranching, which are themselves very violent economies and are not benefiting the majority of borderland populations. So it's not, it's, it's more complicated than saying development brings drugs. It's about certain types of development are associated with increased drug use. So for example, in the jade mines um, of Kachin State, um, I mean, people in, in our life histories of talking to, to people in the borderlands, they say drugs have, have, have come with the building of roads, mm -hmm. the expansion of the mines. Um, you know, people get paid in, in drugs. It's a, it's a, you know, that, so bringing, uh, you know, forms of addiction leads to a more pliant labor force. It's central to the labor regimes and how they function. So what we're, we're, what we're looking at in our project is how, the terms of development and also the, the the role of the state can shift you know the, the distribution effects of development in these borderland spaces and, and deal with spatial inequalities and more in, inclusive forms of development otherwise you know it, it's, it's purely forms of extraction that bring about all these forms of uh, you know, illicit economies and criminality and so on Thank you very much. Nora, I don't know if you want to add to that or not. Um, I think I'm okay. I, I think maybe we should, uh, I think there are a couple other questions, so maybe. Yes, indeed there are, yes. So we're not really supposed to take anonymous questions, but this is irresistible. Uh, question for Aisha, which is an unusual question. Would she be willing to collaborate on the homeschool grammar project with others in Africa? A lot of schools remain closed in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And then I'm guessing this is the same person. Uh, is it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm Uganda living in London. Oh, it's a different person. It's difficult without your names. Wondering what Laura thought. Oh, that, we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. So Aisha, what about this invitation from an anonymous person? So you can't really respond unless they tell you who they are. Please unmute, unmute. Sorry, I always do this. Um, yes, yeah, so the uh, the website is online and uh, it's available to um, to to anyone you know anywhere. Um, you know, as long as they speak English, they can access it. I'm happy also again, depending on 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 who it is that is speaking to me. But I'm 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 very happy to collaborate and and develop the website and make it accessible in um, you know to to people in uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa and in, in, in different languages there. Absolutely happy. Uh, you, can, you can email me actually. I think uh, you, you'll find my email on the, on the SOAS website and I'm, I'm very happy to be emailed about it. So Aisha, while you're on this topic, um, there's the other question. Uh, English grammar understandable, making English grammar understandable for children who speak a language other than English. Could you talk a little more on exactly how this website has impacted the children from the marginalized communities in the UK, please. So I, I don't really know how the website has impacted uh, children from marginalized linguistic communities yet, because I don't, I don't know who has used the, uh, the, the website and who has done the exercises. The website is online and anyone can, you know, download the activities and, and, tr and try these activities. What I do, um, what I hope, and I really hope that this will um, show um, children who speak languages other than English or who speak, you know, varieties that are not standard English, I, I hope that they're going to, um, you know, 
uh, respect their language and respect the, the, the variety of English that they are speaking and, and see that, you know, what they are speaking is a language with a grammar, despite what, you know, people tell them, despite what, you know, they are, they are made to believe. Um, that's, that's the impact that I hope to have, a positive impact. Lovely, thank you very much. So, yes, Laura, you're quite right. A question for you. I'm Ugandan living in London. I was wondering what Laura thought about the open door refugee policy in Uganda and how that coupled with the announcements by WFP in April, May 2020, that it did not have sufficient resources to support these refugees in the face of national lockdown may have affected the outcomes for them during the ongoing pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's a good question. For those who may not be so familiar with the situation in Uganda, there are um, uh, Uganda's hosting something like 1.4 million refugees at the moment, most of them from uh, South Sudan, but also from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Somalia, from Eritrea, other countries. And um, while there are refugee settlements in the country, there is what, what this um, uh, the, the questioner has called an open door uh, policy, which is to say that people um, can come and go between the settlement or the camp and wherever they want to go. They can go to other settlements, they can go to cities. And very what we find is that uh, many refugee households split themselves up. And so some people are living and working in the cities and sending money back to help support their relatives. And some who are receiving rations are also even sharing some of those rations with their relatives outside the settlement. So there have been, prior to COVID, there have been a lot of analyses of this policy to look at whether, what are the pros and cons of it. And in fact, it turns out there are quite a lot of pros to it, not so many cons, that the more mobility that refugees have, the more able they are to support themselves and to, um, to, to protect themselves against uh, disruptions in the pipeline of assistance that may pr be provided to them. So if there's inadequate support from the World Food Programme and UNHCR, um, if they're able to move, that, that has less of an impact on them than if they're not. And that's something that um, in the work that I do in the region, we've held Uganda up as an example. It's not a perfect example by any means. There are lots of problems with the ways that it's carried out, which are, go beyond the purposes of this, uh, tonight's discussion. So it's not perfect, but it is really um, a, quite an improvement over some of the refugee hosting policies that we see in other countries in the region. And so, and Uganda is quite proud of it and they are quite actively kind of trying to export it as a, a form of good practice. So when the lockdowns and the restrictions on movement were put in place and they also affected the refugee populations in Uganda, there was, uh, it, it directly affected people's ability to support themselves and to kind of mitigate against these disruptions in the aid pipeline that I just mentioned. So, um, and, it's, and it really just underscores why mobility is absolutely so important. The more you put in, in peril the support that people can, can rely on from you know, external actors, the more mobility becomes really centrally important. And so, so it's not a new argument really that's come out. It's just really highlighting what many of us have been saying for a very long time that it, the, the answer to donor fatigue and to the dwindling uh, availability of international aid is to relax restrictions on mobility and allow people to help themselves, which is what they're always already doing. I mean, I always tell students on the first day of a class on forced migration, you must keep in mind from the very start that people are not sitting around waiting for international aid to help them. They're automatically immediately trying to help themselves as soon as crisis strikes. And what aid should be doing, if it's doing it well, should be supporting those activities rather than undermining them. So here we have a clear example of uh, restriction on mobility and, and reduction in the amount of aid that really undermines people's ability to help themselves. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Vanya, hi, good evening. We have a lovely question here for Sreya. Sreya, would you be so kind to tell us some more about sex workers' children's plights? during the current pandemic? Yes, sure. Um, thank you so much for that question, Vanya. Um, so in terms of uh, children of sex workers, um, one of the issues that I think um, have sort of come up in news reports, but I think requires a lot more explora explanation 
um, is how they are sort of surviving if they are living with their mothers, how they are surviving, of course. And that would also then lead to questions around, um, again, issues that women sex workers as mothers are facing and how they are um, sort of handling um, problems that are more domestic and family related and related to raising children, as well as um, these kind of work related issues um, and more broader kind of financial and um, mobility oriented problems that they're going through. But also there are um, a lot of, um, in the recent, I would say years, um, a lot of uh, shelter homes have been developed in, across India for children of sex workers, um, primarily to um, allow them to kind of flourish, um, you know, in their own kind of ways and develop new skills and get a better education and sort of like allow them to see what other opportunities there could be for them um, to explore. Um, uh, rather than, you know, go into sex work if that is um, the only or limited option that they have available. Um, now, in these shelter homes, I mean, again, there's not a lot of information as to, um, you know, to what extent have they been uh, consistently effective, especially during this pandemic, um, in terms of the kind of financial support that they receive to help these children. Um, what kind of limitations or blockages have they experienced when it comes to that? Um, or are they taking in new children? If mothers feel helpless and they want to sort of um, get support from these shelters, are they able to send their children during this pandemic? Um, and also um, just how are children kind of dealing with, again, this issue that I have sort of emphasized and I hope to explore more um, is this, you know, problem of um, just sort of relocating or uprooting from what they believe to be home, whether that's a, you know, a, the brothel space or whether that's other, those are other types of, um, you know, homes or shelters or houses, whatever that may be, um, you know, if they have to move around, if they have to find new places, or if mothers have to kind of, you um, move from brothels to go back to their home states, which again, a lot of people, a lot of women are having to do. And if they're doing that with children who do not really know where their mothers really come from, because they have, you know, grown up in this urban kind of city space, um, what is that move like? Um, I think a, a lot of us have heard, uh, you know, news and stories about just general like migrant workers um, walking, from state to state trying to get back home in India. And a lot of them were sort of just, just walking for days and weeks because there was no availability of transportation. So I think just around this question of, you know, children's um, plights and challenges during this pandemic, um, I think it does require a lot more attention than I feel it has been getting. Um, and I hope that, you know, perhaps through research or whatever other form, we're able to bring that to people's attention because um, they are one of the very you know, vulnerable groups of people and um, they're dependent on their mothers. But when you have a, something like this happening like the pandemic and with very limited sort of um, uh, options to how people can survive are available, um, when mothers are they want to be reliant on the government, but they can't, but they cannot, and they have to find other ways to, um, to survive or to cope and heal from this. Um, you know, how do they then become that sort of pillar of, of support for their own children? Um, right. So, yeah, I wish I had more to that question, but that's all I can say. Yeah, you paint a very poignant picture. It's, it's, um, it's extraordinary what these children and their mums have to have to deal with. I wonder if I could ask, we've got about 15 minutes left because we've been asked to finish a little bit early so that the next panel can be warmed up. I wonder if I could ask each panelist to consider a response to one of the issues that particularly Laura and Jonathan have touched upon repeatedly, which is that this is a transnational worldwide event, this pandemic, but it is being responded to in every country that I know about in a national and often nationalistic way 
which presumably is futile in the short and the medium and the long term because of course the the virus knows no boundaries and uh, will move as it sees fit and I wondered if I mean this is a million dollar question I'm sorry to put pressure on you guys but I wondered if each of you starting with Laura might like to hazard a suggestion about what could happen and please inform us also if you see some some good practice coming out of the current situation. Laura. Um, I think it was the UN, Sec UN Secretary General Guterres who, who said a few months ago, you know, the only way that we will beat this pandemic is to treat it as a global issue. And if you think that what's happening in the so-called global south doesn't affect you or that you don't have time to pay attention to it because you're worried about what's happening with COVID-19 in your own country, then you're, you're misunderstanding the nature of this, this kind of global health threat. And I think he was thinking more in terms of public health terms, but, I, but it's also equally valid when you think about the, the economic aspects, the, the ways in which this, this pandemic plays out. And we see that you know, even when prevalence rates, case rates go down, um, that the economic impacts of, of this uh, pandemic play out, continue to play out in this particular society. So I, for me, that's really true. And, and I've kind of reflected back on, on those comments um, repeatedly in the last, several, you know, last few months. Um, it means that, you know, even if, let's say, uh, you know, a vaccine is found in the next however many months, not in the next three months, I don't think, but probably in the next, hopefully in the next six to nine months, Will that mean an end to this crisis? No, I don't think so. I think the, the ways in which the economics of this has have played out, the kinds of um, challenges that have, it has posed to people, particularly people that, that we've been talking about tonight who, who are in marginal sort of societal spaces are going to be feel, felt for a really long time. And so as researchers, for us to think then about how does that change the way that we all work, the, you know, the logistics of how we work, and just like the aid workers that someone asked about, you know, how has it meant the mass evacuation? Yes, it has, but it's also meant the mass evacuation of international researchers. It might mean that we work in very different ways with our internet, with our national collaborators. But it also means that, um, yeah, that we that it alters our questions. It alters our questions about, for instance, Jonathan and I work on borders. The questions we're asking about borders are fundamentally in some cases, in some ways changed because of what's been happening. And that is not gonna go away just because we've now got a vaccine. Um, so I would invite everyone to think about whatever your own re individual research kind of fascination is to, to ask yourselves in what ways does this current situation that we're going through um, change in really key ways some of the questions that you might be asking. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's very thought provoking. Soraya, would you like to try this very difficult question next, <laughs> please? Um, yeah, sure. I think, um, I think personally, just from, um, I guess, just, you know, attending these webinars and conferences and talks, what I've noticed is, um, and I'm very happy when I notice this, is um, this sort of focus on on gender, I think has been quite incredible, especially like I'm, I'm, ba I'm, I live in in Toronto, so in Canada, and I think a lot of the sort of webinars that I've been attending have been um, focused on kind of the local situation here. But even when I think about you know places in the global south, I think there's been a lot of focus on um, kind of revisiting this question of gender or the impact. Um, that this pandemic has on various dimensions of, of gender and sort of sexuality and um, as well as race. Um, but I know that, you know, in terms of like race and class, uh, we have a lot of um, sort of material and, and sort of practical awareness around issues when it comes to race and class. But I think often gender, it, it kind of happens in very sort of um, insidious ways, um, the issues, whether it's in our homes or in social spaces, and often we don't really know how to talk about them or address them because, you know, we're a lot of us are conditioned to think that this is normal. Um, but, but it's been great how, you know, whether it's their organizations or just individuals are 
becoming more aware of this, that, you know, this may have been normal, but to what extent is this normal becoming unpleasant or challenging in this time of the pandemic, when it's very much in our faces and very, con uh, you know, um, confrontational um, in our everyday lives, right? Um, and the other thing I think, um, I think when I'm thinking about my own research interests and um, kind of the issues of sex workers, um, there's been a lot of, um, I think, efforts and, you know, successful attempts of, um, uh, collaborating across borders and, and across sort of transnational spaces to bring to bring in um, perspectives or support from other organizations or other kind of um, you know researchers or you know whatever that may be um, to kind of just work together and as Laura was saying to really understand and just kind of understand this situation as a global pandemic as it is um, but more in kind of active ways of, of thinking about it as a very um, transnational and global issue and how we can address this and move forward from this. Um, but again, that's there's also a lot of uncertainties when it comes to thinking about how do we move forward and you know what the future holds and all, all those things. But I think I'm glad that a lot of people are actually starting to think that way. And, and yeah, a lot of, I think, positivity is, is coming from that. I think it's personally it can be very therapeutic so I enjoy when I <laughs> sort of hear these things um, you know about the future um, so yeah yeah thank you thank you it's good to have a positive note as well thank you very much Aicha would you like to unmute and give us your solution or your view on this yes um, I think my what I have to say is a little bit less positive than uh, than Shreya I'm sorry for uh, um, for breaking the, the positive cycle. Um, what we see from a language perspective is, uh, I mean, there, there is some positive in some countries, but there is also uh, some worrying trends that we're seeing from the linguistic perspective. As I was talking, you know, towards, as I was saying towards the beginning of my talk, we are really seeing an acceleration uh you know of the death of some languages and 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 we don't really i mean you know the the death of a language the, the disappearance of a language or languages is some is a trend that we really cannot change um you know already but when it it goes faster because of a crisis like uh the covid 19 pandemic then there is really nothing that we can do unfortunately you know once the uh the last speakers of a language succumb to covid 19 then that's it the language is dead and and that's it and uh we are not in a position uh researchers uh linguists are not in a position you know to go to the the field and 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 recall those last words from from the last speakers so so this is this is really worrying and 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 not really positive um now i want to say something positive as well i don't want to end on something negative the positive i think is that in certain countries and particularly in countries as i was saying in algeria in countries that really for um, such a long time did not care about uh, the minority languages, uh, did not want uh, to acknowledge, to officialize these languages, to, you know, um, teach them at school, to include them in education, in culture, in, in politics. Uh, they are now forced to uh, include them in the picture. They are now forced to translate information in these languages because, uh, well, because they have no other choice. If they want to, you know, avoid, uh, you know, the uh, a worsening of the crisis, if they want, you know, to prevent uh, uh, the, 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 the a, a, a bigger death toll, then they have to uh, take into account these languages and translate them. And this is what they are, what some countries are doing. Algeria is doing this. Um, and um, yes, and, and, and this is good. Lovely. Thank you very much, Archer. This, it, I understand uh, your position, positive and negative. Jonathan, over to you. Thanks, Ison. Um, <laughs> nice question to finish with, isn't it? <laughs> Um, 
I mean, from I'm t- from the perspective of um, the research that we're doing, what I mean comes out for us is the the and, and certainly Laura's work speaks to this issue is the, the centrality of the margins that mm. these you know whether we're talking about pandemics, whether we're talking about fragile states, whether we're talking about illicit drugs, we can't just see these as things that are out there that can somehow be contained and dealt with in these these kind of unruly places. Um, they're, they're very much linked to what's happening here. And I guess what we're trying to do in our project is build up a kind of a more relational approach, which sees how what's happening in the borderlands shifts and change what happens in the center and vice versa. And to think about those relationships more seriously. Um, I think that's, so COVID is a great illustration of this and hopefully it'll open up new kind of avenues for scholarship, Mm. um, which kind of, I guess, leads to a a different understanding of the cartography of power and uh, sets of interests and and, and policies in relation to this. I get there are some kind of practical things that we're working on um, about the implications of this perspective. So how, how to go beyond methodological nationalism and uh, if you look at uh, the aid world in particular, how it's set up, you have country teams, country budgets, country monitoring valuation systems, um, you know, and, and, and statistics is generated at the country level. So how do we go beyond that kind of way of seeing the world in thinking about it more regionally and looking at it from the perspective of those in the borderlands who, who are often straddling several countries um, moving around and, and don't feel particular loyalty to any one one country. So I think there's some some really kind of difficult but interesting questions about how uh, donors and international actors organise themselves and how they might organise themselves differently. Um, and in, in the expertise they generate. I mean, Saras is a great example of this. How how do you in aid work, you, you you go you get promoted by going from one country to another and getting new ex, different experiences. You don't you don't get promoted for knowing a region well and knowing the language and you know and so you know there are some kind of questions about the incentives within uh, institutions and whether they reward this kind of understanding that goes goes beyond um, a kind of status view of the world. I mean, I, I guess. If we want to finish off <laughs> on some optimistic notes, and I'm grasping at straws here, um, you could argue that this crisis has shown the importance of science and social science in particular and the contributions it can make to public policy. You could argue that this crisis has opened up an understanding of how important states actually are in spite of the problems of you know, status view of the world. Having a strong state um, that can respond to these issues is, you know, a, a kind of an awakening and also showing how global governance is actually really very important um, to tackle these kind of questions around inequality and social justice, political justice. So you could argue <laughs> there's there's some spaces opening up, um, but obviously there's some very strong counterforces to that as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We need to bring it to the close. I hope that this panel, which I think has been absolutely brilliant, has demonstrated very clearly the centrality of SOAS and the research undertaken at SOAS, because without people like these four brilliant scholars to interpret for us and explain what they already know about before COVID overtook us, without that deep knowledge, it would not be possible to understand what is happening to these regions and indeed to the world as a whole. So I'm very, very grateful to you. It's tremendous work you're doing. It's been a fantastic panel. I just want to say a few quick, very quick thank yous. Um, A thank you first to Dr. Vanya Hamzic, who had this idea in the first place and um, invited me to run with it and set it up. Very brilliant idea. Thank you, Vanya. I want to thank um, Stephanie Guiron and Kumi. Thank you so much for making this all technologically fabulously smooth. And... Most of all, really, to Dr. Armini Yakin, who set up the Festival Ideas and who made this all possible. It's a tremendous labour of love and it's worked brilliantly and I've enjoyed every moment of what I've participated in. So to, to, to conclude,
Thank you so much, speakers. I think we should give you all give you a little metaphorical clap. And I'm so grateful that you were prepared to give up your time um, from all over the world uh, to be with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.